social class. That enigmatic, all-encompassing and life-altering term that, for better or worse, has been synonymous with the history of our lovely island for almost 1,000 years. Indeed, the United Kingdom's class system holds particular global notoriety, with the notions of monarchy, landed gentry, and the working class continuing to define the contours of British society to this very day. George Orwell himself noted this dynamic in 1941, calling Britain quite simply the most class-ridden society under the sun. Now, of course, all of this is not to say that other countries do not have a social class hierarchy. Far from it, most countries possess a complex system of status or hereditary caste. However, while many advanced nations have proactively, whether through legislation or all-out war, attempted to collapse their historical class system, the United Kingdom has held tightly to this structural archetype. As Helmut Schmidt, the then Chancellor of West Germany, put it in 1975, if one asks oneself what are the true reasons for the differentiated development of societies and economies between the British and most ones on the European continent, I think it has something to do with the fact that British society, much more than the Scandinavian, German, Austrian and Dutch societies, is characterized by class struggle. This is true for both sides of the upper class as well as for the working classes. Yet, the presence of this persistent hierarchy does not make the British social structure entirely transparent. With nuance abound and the so-called unwritten rules of the class system in Britain confounding many across the globe. Thus, in today's video at Old Money Luxury, we'll lift the curtain on the Western world's most famous system of social class, guiding you first through the history of how each stratum developed, and then providing you with a template of how social class in the United Kingdom exists as it stands today. But first, we must turn back the clock a bit to learn where the first lines of social demarcation on Albion were formed. To fully comprehend the intricacies of the British class system, we must revisit the pivotal Norman conquest of 1066. During this defining moment, William the Conqueror led his Normans to triumph at Hastings. This decisive win began a slow and gradual takeover of the area, not without fierce Saxon resistance, giving rise to years of guerrilla warfare. In due time, the relentless Normans secured control over England, granting lands to loyal knights who evolved into the ruling class. This newly formed elite, driven by territorial gains, constructed grand cathedrals and castles that can still be seen today, including Canterbury Cathedral, Durham Cathedral, the Tower of London, and even the structure from which our royal family gets its current name, Windsor Castle. Now it's from this Norman gentry that our first current stratum of modern British society is derived. You see, even in the 21st century, aristocratic families like the Percys and Groveners, tied to vast estates across the country, have roots reaching back to the Norman conquerors. But more on that later, let's get back to our history. The Saxons, in contrast to the Normans, were reduced to a lower status, grappling with an almost apartheid existence. Yet the acute division began to blur as the Normans, more enticed by land than lineage, married Saxon women. These unions began a fusion of Norman and Saxon traditions, progressively erasing the lines between them, laying the groundwork for a ruling class. Across centuries, the once clear distinctions between Normans and Saxons gradually faded through mingling and marriage. The Normans, symbolized by the Plantagenet flower, continued ruling over lands and castles filled with Saxon peasants. This merger, evolving over hundreds of years, led the growing nation from sheer inequality to a more harmonious society, imprinting a unique mark on England's social structure. In the Norman conquest's wake, English society was tightly defined, with Normans as aristocrats and Saxons as peasants. But within this distinction, a hybrid group emerged, acting both as peasants and professionals. From these original hierarchical relationships lies the core of the English class system, enduring with minor tweaks, continually shaping the English social order. Indeed, that legacy continues to define the nation's cultural fabric, even today. Now, the Black Death of the 14th century served as a remarkable pivot, reforming England's social structure and significantly altering the country's demographic makeup. This pestilence obliterated around half the population, leaving indelible imprints on the social hierarchy. And unexpectedly, it led to a linguistic shift. While the ruling class had spoken French and the Saxons had spoken English, 
the Black Death weakened the ruling class's grip on French, making English the common language. Some argue this was further bolstered by the gradual merging and marriage between Normans, Plantagenets and Saxons. Now this period witnessed the emergence of an English identity, still class divided, but with the rise of a new class. Specifically those managing lands for their Norman lords symbolized a nascent middle class. Additionally, from the 14th to the 15th century, maritime trade began to thrive, giving birth to a merchant class that slowly started accumulating wealth, subtly starting to restructure society. Furthermore, the Black Death's impact extended to the peasantry's economic standing. A decline in labor availability led to increased wages, significantly improving their living conditions. While the social structure remained distinctively layered, the stratification persisted primarily through intra-aristocratic marriages, land inheritance, and continued baronial titles. Marriages with commoners were deliberately avoided to maintain class lines. Despite the peasantry's improved situation, they stayed landless, overshadowed by inherited wealth. Within this stringent structure, an English identity was forming, marked by a recognizable upper class of gentry and aristocrats, burgeoning middle-class traces, and an enduring working class of peasants. This hierarchy's rigidity, where marriage across social levels was unthinkable, solidified the class system for generations. Furthermore, the intricate interplay between royalty and aristocracy was pivotal in maintaining this equilibrium. The king's decisions were judiciously weighed to ensure loyalty and satisfaction among ruling nobles. This complex structure extended beyond the king, intertwining relationships from monarchy to peasantry, securing a social order that still resonates in the multifaceted fabric of British society. Thus, the Black Plague indeed flipped the social chessboard, the effects of which linger even now. Now, the English Civil War serves as a remarkable chapter in British history, set against a complex backdrop. Unlike some European revolutionary events where nobles faced losses or banishment, the entrenched class framework and long-standing aristocratic privileges in Britain remained resilient. The societal structure saw a recalibration after the Black Death, enhancing peasant lives and beginning the formation of English identity. The aristocracy's hold on land, the emergence of a managerial middle-class tier, and the delicate balance between the king and ruling class contributed to an enduring social order, one still shaping Britain today. Moving forward, England's transformation from mainly Catholic to Protestant, with lingering Catholic elements, partly ignited the civil war during the mid-17th century. These conflicts, from 1640 to the early 1650s, were framed as Crown versus Parliament. Parliament, though termed the House of Commons, mainly consisted of aristocrats and gentry, opposing the king's divine right belief. The vital distinction between England and the continent lay in the aristocracy's fate. Unlike elsewhere, England's aristocrats endured. In contrast, the French Revolution led to the violent dismantling of the aristocracy, resulting in a complete transformation of the societal hierarchy. The German revolutions of the 19th century, while less dramatic than France's, aimed for greater democracy and social mobility, seeking to diminish the influence of the traditional aristocracy. These continental revolutions marked significant ruptures with the past and paved the way for new societal norms and structures, unlike in England when parliamentarians, chiefly from aristocratic and gentry backgrounds, retained their status connected to their heritage. Oliver Cromwell, descended from a Norman knight of William the Conqueror's time, embodies this. Now, while sometimes seen as aristocracy versus commoners, the Civil War was fundamentally a clash between the aristocracy and royal power, with the aristocrats' victory explaining their continued hold. Still, the story has added layers. The apparent rigidity of England's class system may be misunderstood. No historical point required a violent overthrow of the aristocracy, largely because they continued to rule over the other classes. This unique trajectory influenced the social order distinctively, preserving traditions that still resonate in British society. Additionally, the absence of a need for forceful aristocratic overthrow extended to control over the church. Bishops and archbishops were often aristocrats' children, making higher church positions unattainable for commoners. This hereditary structure reinforced social barriers, restricting mobility and strengthening the existing order. After the English Civil War, a tranquil era began, with English privateers eagerly seeking trading opportunities in places like India and the Caribbean. 
these commercial pursuits set the stage for the British Empire, initiating imports of commodities like sugar, tea and coffee. The rise of this mercantile class, often originating as commoners or mid-level managers who gained wealth through skilled trades, signalled significant evolution. Aristocrats too capitalised on this economic shift, investing in these bold ventures. Now, contrary to popular belief, the British Empire's foundation was fueled more by trade than colonisation. For example, the British East India Company led in securing a presence in India, not the royals or nobility first, focusing on acquiring and exporting spices, tea and goods. This humble start, driven by the desire to protect and expand trade, led to control over vast territories. Thus, Britain's empire was essentially commercial. Its island geography and naval superiority allowed the Royal Navy to protect vital sea routes from South America to the Caribbean, India and Africa. This economic and military growth bolstered Britain's global influence, but sparked conflicts with other European powers, especially the Spanish, French and Dutch. Intriguingly, the Portuguese remained friendly, an exception in Europe where territorial and resource battles often sparked aggression. A century of wars between Britain, Spain, France and the Dutch laid groundwork for global conflict. The intense English-French rivalry, with Britain winning through better fundraising, led to financial Britain, including the City of London, primarily financing the Navy, conquering lands and creating trade routes. Again, here we see coming to the fore a benchmark for the growth of a societal stratum present in modern Britain's social class structure. Now, simultaneously, the Industrial Revolution was taking shape in England's Midlands, with innovators like Quakers leading changes in iron and steel. This era marked Britain's golden age as national wealth grew, benefiting not only aristocrats, but also a rising middle class of merchants, financiers and bankers. Unlike traditional aristocrats, this middle class's wealth was industrial and commercial, not landed. Their rise didn't lead to revolution. Many indeed acquired titles, joining the ruling elite. 19th century figures like Sir John Elliman, Thomas Holloway and George Cadbury, among others, resembled modern tycoons like Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos, amassing fortunes through trade, not land. These industrial pioneers, despite vast wealth, still often sought aristocratic titles, drawn by the allure of status and prestige. Their fortunes might have outshone the old aristocracy, but the appeal of its cachet remained irresistible. The transformation of peasants into urban working-class individuals, ignited by the Industrial Revolution, signified a crucial shift in Britain's social framework. With the British Empire's rise, the traditional aristocratic wealth rooted in land began to wane, contrasting sharply with the burgeoning prosperity derived from trade, invention and industry. The diminishing control of the aristocracy saw their fortunes decline, while the middle and upper middle classes grew. Even some nouveau riche sought to align with aristocratic ranks by purchasing titles, yet the appeal of aristocratic status continued, despite its fiscal fall. Urbanization, prompted by factories in cities like Birmingham, Manchester and London, led to massive rural-to-urban migration, giving birth to the modern working class. Often confined to stringent conditions, this shift ignited calls for reform, and wealthy industrialists like Roundtree and Lever emerged as advocates for workers' rights. The 20th century saw the evolution of landless peasants into urban workers, extending to occupations in call centres, shops and banking, reflecting a broader social mobility. Fueled by hard work and accessible education, this transition epitomises Britain's economic and cultural transformation, intertwining trade, industry, status and learning. While the transformation from peasants to urban workers solidified the working class, the middle class burgeoned, spurred by industrial, commercial and imperial growth. The need for managers, legal minds, accountants and healthcare professionals cultivated a managerial class that arguably seized influence after World War II, undermining traditional aristocratic sway. Post-war and labor's rise, akin to the US Democrats, and policies taxing aristocratic lands significantly reshaped wealth distribution and Britain's societal image. This period marked a turning point, with labor's influence growing alongside the middle class. Concurrently, the upper class, enriched through industry and commerce, also evolved. This complex history, encompassing aristocrats, working and managerial classes, sketches a multifaceted picture of Britain's societal evolution. It reflects shifts not just in wealth but also in cultural values, political dynamics and professional roles, all of which continue to shape modern British society. Now, 
Before we explore the modern 21st century social class structure of the United Kingdom, let's consider the matter of accents, often thought to reveal everything about British social class. In the UK, accent or pronunciation is a key indicator of social class, though not the sole or most crucial one. However, it is indeed true that speech is often the first overtly noticeable class indicator. Working class individuals might have stronger regional accents, such as London's glottal stop, prominent in Guy Ritchie's gangster films, or the distinct accents of Liverpudlians or Mancunians, as heard in actor Stephen Graham or the band Oasis, respectively. Middle class individuals, ranging from lower to upper middle class, may exhibit regional accents, but these are typically more moderate while upper-middle-class individuals often aim for a more neutral British tone. Upper-class voices, especially those cultivated in elite schools like Eton, may result in a slightly plummy tone, exemplified by conservative commentator Douglas Murray. Remaining aristocrats, mostly educated at the top schools, speak in the original, distinctive, plummy English, often identifying members of the aristocracy or gentry or those aspiring to these ranks. But remember, accent is just one facet of recognizing social class. Marital decisions and aspirational beliefs are even more significant, as we'll see in a moment. So keep these factors in mind as we delve into our structure. And now, the moment you've all been waiting for, a full breakdown of the 21st century social structure of the United Kingdom. At the pinnacle of the British social class hierarchy stands, of course, the royal family. Delving into their lineage, it's intriguing to note the German roots of the Windsors. Originally, the House of Windsor bore the Germanic name Saxe, Coburg and Gotha. It was during World War I, due to contemporary anti-German sentiment, that King George V decided to adopt the more anglicized Windsor, named after the iconic Windsor Castle. This historical transition underscores the adaptability of the royal family, a trait ensuring its continued relevance and survival. For many citizens, the royal's modern significance in the social order is cemented by tradition and the feeling of being the head of the body of a nation. With this, the social expectations of the royals include being above the fray of petty cultural and political squabbles, exemplifying the highest decorum and class, and maintaining the keep calm and carry on attitude that our nation ideally embodies. Additionally, they are stewards of vast estates with royal palaces and crown lands under their purview, establishing the royal crown as Britain's paramount landowner. And while they are beneficiaries of state funding, which supports their regal lifestyles, their roles aren't solely ceremonial. A hallmark of the monarchy is its commitment to public service and representing the nation on the world stage. This ethos is exemplified in King Charles III's naval tenure, his sons Prince William and Prince Harry's military careers, and the charitable endeavors of many other royals, weaving a tapestry of duty and tradition. Next, we have the aristocracy. While their wealth and influence have diminished, they remain a significant presence in British society, reportedly owning an astonishing 20% of the country's land. Many in this class have noble roots in the UK, extending back a millennium, as mentioned in the beginning of this video, with the descendants of William the Conqueror still retaining vast lands. Some aristocrats reside in cities, especially London's posh areas like Kensington and Notting Hill. Still, most occupy ancestral estates stretching from Cornwall to the Shetland Islands, passed down through generations. Should aristocrats find themselves in cities, it's often in esteemed locales, perhaps after selling country estates or converting them into hotels. Moreover, they have marked a global presence in cities like New York, Los Angeles or even Dubai. However, some aristocrats have recently faced difficulties, with signs of their influence waning and estates decaying, as evidenced by a recent viral video from 60 Minutes Australia that has a thumbnail captioned, Rich People Problems. Despite this, for those still flourishing, the modern aristocracy is keen on maintaining bloodlines, as marriages are strategically arranged among the sons and daughters of aristocratic families, often facilitated through exclusive gatherings. While it might occasionally occur that an aristocratic member marries a commoner, the general expectation is to marry within their social stratum. This deliberate coupling ensures the passage of land and titles, preserving the aristocratic lineage. Just beneath the aristocracy lies the upper middle class, characterized by wealthy professionals and remaining industrialists, even encompassing those who've acquired titles. It's noteworthy to observe, unlike the firm boundaries common with the aristocracy and underclass, 
the middle classes present substantial mobility. Individuals from the lower middle class may rise into the middle or even upper middle tiers, with the possibility of further ascent to the upper echelons through success. Property ownership in this context becomes an anchoring trait, solidifying a privileged status within the multifaceted and nuanced social hierarchy. The significance of esteemed institutions like Oxford and Cambridge, as well as the intriguing matter of purchase titles, lends further texture to this stratum. Figures such as Boris Johnson and David Cameron exemplify this class's economic and political vitality. Dwelling in refined London areas like Notting Hill and Richmond, or situated in charming country locales such as Cheltenham, they lead lifestyles commensurate with their position. The upper middle class, sprung from prosperous merchant families, mirrors more than economic status. It also reflects shared pursuits, culture and values. This interweaving of wealth and tradition within the class sketches a compelling portrait of an essential layer of contemporary British society. Now, the middle class, comprising key sectors like executives and professionals, includes roles such as managers, consultants, lawyers, doctors and architects. Their living environments are varied, with younger individuals often opting for gentrified city areas filled with trendy boutiques and cultural attractions, while older generations may favour suburban settings, residing in detached or semi-detached residences close to schools and parks. For this class, aspiration stands prominently. These families typically seek a professional, comfortable life and view education, hard work and networking as pathways to success. They often imbue their children with similar ambitions, fostering a culture of achievement and continuous improvement. Social activities, hobbies and affiliations with various clubs or organisations might be significant, reflecting their status and interests. Now, the growth of the lower middle class has been spurred by industrialization and commercialization, encompassing individuals in roles such as office workers, clerks, bookkeepers, estate agents and teachers. Generally residing in more modest suburban areas, this class reflects an aspirational quality, distinguishing them from the working class. Their ambitions frequently center on clerical roles and home ownership, distinctive markers of their lower middle class status. This group is prevalent across Britain, especially on London's fringes and in mid-sized towns like Nottingham, Derby, Brighton, or in cities like Leeds. The essential thing to understand about the lower middle class is their aspiration. They yearn for middle class status, yet often lack the professional acknowledgement or income to attain it. Then there's the working class, a demographic evolving with the closure of Britain's traditional industries like shipbuilding, coal mining and car manufacturing. While these industries have largely receded, a segment of the working class remains engaged in manufacturing. Despite common perceptions, manufacturing still persists in Britain, with working class members employed in factories, call centres and shops. Some trade professions that were historically associated with this class are actually quite lucrative, subtly indicating that all is not what it seems by strictly adhering to the so-called class structure. Now, today's working class can also be aspirational, even owning their homes, although typically not to the degree of the lower middle class. They may occupy council accommodation or buy houses in economically disadvantaged areas, including inner-city regions outside London such as Birmingham and Manchester, or in working-class towns like Liverpool, Leeds, Newcastle and various Midlands locations. Last, we turn to the underclass, a term borrowed from the Americans, referring to those typically chronically unemployed. This group, in many ways, is an enduring part of British society, sometimes spanning two or three generations living under the same stagnant condition. Predominantly residing on council estates, akin to American projects, the underclass survives through state benefits or welfare, often supplemented by petty crime. This segment of the population, often found in large cities like London, Manchester and Glasgow, is marked by a likely persistence in their current economic and social position throughout their lives. Their presence, though not extensive, is notably marked in many inner city areas, symbolized by large tower blocks, which are seen as the characteristic dwelling places of the underclass. Of course, no discussion on the social structure of the United Kingdom would be complete without a few points on immigration. The Irish have historically been the most prominent immigrant group in the United Kingdom. This migration began continuously from Ireland to Britain and escalated sharply in the 19th century due to the ravages of the Great Famine and the job opportunities created by the Industrial Revolution. 
A notable illustration of this heritage is the Beatles, who primarily have Irish ancestry. John Lennon's songwriting, including pieces like The Luck of the Irish and Paul McCartney's maternal lineage, with his grandfather Joseph McCartney born in County Monaghan, Ireland in 1876, highlight this connection. Approximately 6 million people in the UK, or around 10% of the population, have at least one Irish grandparent. Though the Irish-born population in England and Wales has diminished recently, their cultural impact endures. Now, from the mid-20th century onward, immigration from outside of Europe has begun to significantly reshape Britain's class structure. Starting slowly and then increasing exponentially since the 1990s, immigrants have arrived primarily from the Asian subcontinent, Sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East. These immigrants initially found employment in traditional working-class roles, like retail or the restaurant industry. However, over time, increasingly large numbers of immigrants and their descendants have ascended to nearly every level of the social hierarchy, most notably the Prime Minister himself, Rishi Sunak. The framework of class in Britain, therefore, extends beyond mere accent or financial status. It involves a delicate balance of aspiration, breeding, marriage, education and inheritance. The interplay of these factors forms a multifaceted picture of social strata, reflecting both rigid barriers and potential pathways for mobility. And now, we'd like to see you in the comments. What is one of your personal secrets for determining a person's social class? Do you have any methods your parents taught you? Or perhaps something you picked up in life to recognize the signs? We'd absolutely love to hear from you. Thank you again for your continued viewership, as always. And cheers, until next time, from us here at Old Money Luxury.